This is just a sample of the audiobook. To get the complete audiobook access the link posted in the first comment. In late December 2003, Mark Plumberg couldn't know that he would one day become the lead investigator in the most intense and frustrating homicide probe he has ever known. Almost a decade later, he still wakes in the darkest hours of the night and thinks about it. In June 2004, he revisited the Russell Douglas murder investigation from scratch, reading over the stacks of follow-up reports and statements he and Mike Birchfield had gathered. After he had re-interviewed Sandra Malley, the glass artisan in Freeland, Plumberg's chosen person of interest was Eddie Navarre. Almost everything Sandra Malley said about the juice entrepreneur made him a very plausible suspect. Mark Plumberg listened carefully as she added more about Navarre. She had known him in the 80s in Sarasota, Florida. She worked in a health food store at the time, and he had been into nutrition even though he had always been overweight. At that time, they had been casual friends, hanging out and partying together. He used heroin, Sandra said. He also used to hang out at health clubs, and he picked up prostitutes. Was he homosexual or bisexual? I wasn't aware of that, but I wouldn't put it past him. I stopped hanging around with him because of his temper. It was scary and we suspected that he sometimes carried guns. Sandra Malley didn't know how Navarre had found her in 2003, all the way across the country, and after such a long time. She guessed that he might have known that she moved to the Seattle area, but was mystified how he could have found her on Whidbey Island. My phone number isn't listed, she said. I sometimes advertise in the local papers here, but I haven't since early autumn. And then I didn't use my name, only my glass business name. Did he know any of your friends on the island? She shook her head. She had talked with a small circle of friends who knew where she lived, and none of them had ever heard of Navarre. I just don't know. He told me he drove by my house many times. He even used the term stalked when he talked about finding me. He said he had to be convinced that I lived here before he knocked on my door. I remember he said that I had no idea what he went through to find me. Eddie Navarre had always told stories about his life that Sandra doubted. After Christmas 2003, he explained that he had come up the West Coast from California, looking for some place to live that was laid back, where there would be no hassles. He told her he had been living with an older woman in California, who was in the movie business. She could not tell Mark Plumberg any details on crimes Navarre might have committed, but she did know that he'd had minor brushes with police. That didn't matter. He had already obtained Eddie Navarre's rap sheet. So you moved out here, and you hadn't heard from him before. Not until November. He called me out of the blue on Thanksgiving, this last Thanksgiving. I talked to him for a while but I made sure he knew I wasn't interested in seeing or hearing from him again. Sandra thought she had succeeded in blowing Navarre off. At that time, he lived a good distance away in Redmond, the town where Russell Douglas had worked for Tetra Tech, and then in a penthouse suite in a hotel in Linwood, Washington, which wasn't far from the Muckleteo ferry dock. He told me he left Redmond because he had an argument with his landlady. Did Eddie Navarre have a gun? I'm not sure, but he told me several times that he was protected because you never know. He may have actually told me he had a gun, but I never saw one. Eddie Navarre had always seemed paranoid about the police, and he used very bigoted terms for minorities. Black people, gay people, cops, and basically everyone who wasn't white like him. Although Navarre had purported to be a hippie, Sandra had seen that he coveted a lavish lifestyle and put a price on almost everything. His current occupation was with some company that sold healthy juice bar franchises for $25,000. He said his boss was located in Arizona, and the 2001 van he was driving was a company car. It was a nice Chrysler van that was silver and gold. Sandra had written down the license number, and Birchfield had checked it out before.